Hello, Nana here. Welcome back to Path of Exile. We're playing in uh, the Fall of Oriaf expansion. Harbinger League, though, for this episode, that doesn't really matter all that much. Because we have arrived in X7. And that, of course, means a lore episode. Gonna have a chat with everybody in town. Listen to what they have to say about the lore of the game. And then we're gonna end the episode. And next episode, we're actually gonna start playing. So, let's have a listen. What'll I do now? This here broken bridge speaks to me some. A fair place to rest my old bones for a bit. And tell you what, with all this sunlight and fresh air, I can feel the calling forth of the poetic muse beneath me trousers. Been a long time since I felt this here compass point in any direction. Now, speaking of navigations and the like, a long time ago, I had me a nice collection of riches stuffed away in a lockbox. Being the stupid ass that I am, I buried the thing one eve when I was high in my cups. Can't for the death of me remember where I... Except, I knew it was near this broken bridge. The box has a silver locket in it. Holds the portrait of my late wife, Meredith. It's the last thing I have in this world to remember her by. If you happen across my lockbox in your travels, I'd be appreciating of its return. It's a bit of an embarrassing affair, truth be told. Thought I could return to the golden days, you know. Be a terror of the high seas like in my youth. <laughs> problem was, they'd all forgotten me. Those young blighters sailing about, they had no clue who I even were. Figured if I could complete another great feat, like slaying that sea bitch Mervale, maybe that had earned me my respect back. <sighs> Suppose I don't need to tell you, that girl is stronger than she looks. All it took were one slip of the old hands, and next I knew the Black Crest were wrecked against the coast, and I'm getting myself eaten alive by that hag. Peeled each separate muscle from my bones, she did. I tell you, it weren't pretty. It weren't pretty. Oh, probably he faced her before Merville got nerfed. I, I know Lily be missing me something great, and it cuts me deep not to go visit the lass. Thing is, I reckon she should remember me as I was. Not wretch at the sight of the spectre I be now. Let the legend live on in her mind, I say. Pondium? Think of the worst place ye can imagine. That's Pondium. Now think. Of the gods be damned, best whorehouse you've ever had the pleasure of. <laughs> That's Pondium. A pirate paradise full of bodies to stab, holes to fill, and devious liquor to imbibe. Brine rots control the whole island and make sure it lives up to the lowest of expectations. Can't imagine much has changed since I was there last. Still, it's a good place to swash your buckle and make love to a bawdy, buxom bunter out back of a boozy bar. They are taking the whole allegoration, alliteration, that's the word, alliteration. A little far, aren't they? Just all those words starting with the same letters and sounds. It's uh, back in Act 6, Bastel also had a Bit of a habit of doing it, and Wade and Roth is just as poetic as Bestel. Aye, them brine rods be a nasty bunch. Led by me very own flesh and blood, me baby sister Lucy. The rod mother, they call her now. Used to be that I were their leader, back when the brine rods were about one thing, and one thing only, raiding, pillaging and plundering their scrawny black goods out. Old Lucy were me first mate for years. 
But she got her whiff of the power that being captain could gain her, and mutineered me, me own sister. Drop me on some deserted island of the coast of somewhere. The bitch took months to make it back to the mainland. That Brinerod clan's been trouble ever since. Used to have some good old-fashioned pirate on them. And now, they're raving mad lunatics out for their next fix of fear and fortune. I do like how they're using the, the lore of these six new acts to tie a lot of the things from previous expa previous expansions just back into the story about the the brine rods being one of the one of the clans from the warbands expansion for example always keep your eyes on the horizon judging by that rather curious ship and its aberrant captain i imagine you had rather an interesting voyage here now Inquisitor Maligaro. We must have a soul. He has most certainly returned to his old haunt, yet his manifestations are like wisps on the wind. They are one moment, gone the next. While I am familiar with the phantasmal trails and tributaries that filigree this reality, Maligaro's exact whereabouts salutes me. You should speak with these desperates who cling to this broken bridge, that young Templar scholar in particular. Their mundane knowledge must provide where my enlightened sapiens cannot. Origins of the gods. There was a time before the beast, bathed in the shadows of lost memory, when men and women like you could ascend. Through rareness of quality and the adoration of their people, these few could reach out into the quickening mists of immortality and grasp the power of godhood. Mind you, transcendence is never easy. Like the pains of childbirth, it reeks of agony, tragedy, and sacrifice. The sacrifice most often being of one's humanity. That is simply the way of it. Those of us who seek the immortal throne live long enough to see ourselves become truly monstrous. There's a certain irony in that. Ermir, he is still alive. Ah, yes. You do seem to have a penchant for presenting yourself when times are at their most uh, perplexing. It would seem that our Almighty has forsaken us. False deities from ages past now rise and ravage while our blessed innocence remains as silent as the stones at my feet. So much for Templar propaganda, eh? Well, I suppose if we are to fend for ourselves, then I should answer your troubling arrival with our own most pressing tribulation. The relic that washed ashore and started all the chaos. It was covered in ancient vowel inscriptions. The symbols were much weathered, making them challenging to translate. Yet I did my best. The inscriptions spoke of the god Ralakesh. If this object somehow housed the spirit of that many-faced monstrosity, then I fear we are all in danger. Ralakesh was renowned for his penchant for subjugation and control. Please, I urge you to destroy this god before his strength and dominance grow insurmountable. Nip this divine threat in the bud, as it were. Our poor friend, Grust, has likely become Ralikesh's avatar in this world. At least his recent behavior would indicate as much. If you could see to Grust's passing, Ralikesh will be forced to retreat into the relic. Destroy the relic, and perhaps you will also destroy the god. So, good old Grust. Never really liked exiles, so it's fitting that if exile would end him. Yes, Ralikesh, the god of many faces. I read about this god when I looked after the museum in Theopolis. It said he was obsessed with governance, 
in particular the control of humanity through our base animal instincts. He ruled over the citizens of one unfortunate Val city. Alas, the name escapes me. Yet I do recall that his experiments brought his subjects to the brink of extinction, and that he was forced to enslave many a primitive Asmerian of the time so as to repopulate his domain. Though I shudder at the thought, I can only imagine that Ralikesh has rather similar plans now. Another card, another kill. Wow, no voice acting yet for Silk. It started with a few mumblings in his slumber. Then long forays the wilds, searching for relics of a distinctly arachnid nature. I thought it a natural extension of Silk's eccentric persona at first. Then came the sleepless nights studying those relics. The fevered re recitations in broken valish, the strange eight phase rituals, and one night, Silk gathered his collection and scuttled off into the darkness without a word. Silk has always been susceptible to fine fictions. Perhaps he has finally shunned reality altogether. Okay, so that, that's a little sloppy. I mean, in this case, Silk's disappearance is part of the main storyline of Act 7, so it seems like a bit of a gross oversight. Let's see what he has to say about Whalem. If he has something to say about Whalem. A fascinating case that flies in the face of all that is natural. Whalem is undead for sure. Something we have in spades in Rayclast. But a sentient, reasonable ghost? Now that is rare indeed. When we talk, I feel as if I'm staring into the breach, witnessing that which man was not meant to know. I have theorized about what animates the pirate's essence, how he manages to manifest on this earth once again. I think I shall compile my observations and speculations into a book. Yes, Eremir's Elucidations of Undeath. Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? A very the nice end ring. of learning is the beginning of death. Vina. You arrive. The great spirit spoke in my dreams, told me that darkness would again drown our lands, and you, exile, would walk before the flood. But what is this? You are not alone. A shade, a memory, older even than... No, older than spirit? Fear grips my throat, I shake, but the spirit drapes a warming cloak upon my shoulders. This ancient ghost that follows you, it has the trust of the spirit. And if the spirit trusts, then I trust. I still think Ina is a bit of an old duck. My heart weeps for our old home. But what the spirit gives, we must embrace. The spirit, it claims who it needs to, when it needs to. There is no sense in sadness. I watch Silk for many days, scurrying to this old Val stone, scurrying to that old Val ruin, always muttering. He talked and talked and talked, yet I heard no one answer. The spirit warned that I should stay away from him. It pained me. Silk is my friend, yet I must listen to spirit. I go from Silk's side, and now he is gone from mine. I do not know where Silk go. But I see him in dreams. He is caught in great spider web that stretch into darkness. And that spider web? It is full of bones. More bones from more people than I ever see in my life. If you find Silk, please free him from the web. Don't let him become bones like the rest. Itsy bitsy spider. Rayclast has changed. Once? I knew my place in this world. I knew my place within the spirit. Now, doorways have opened. Doorways I can neither see nor touch, but through which the spiritless ones pass all the same. 
The spiritless ones must be driven back. Their doors must be closed. May the great spirit guide you in your battles against these ancients that mean us nothing but ill. Sure. I belong to no one but the spirit. I have no need for the sweet words and caresses of a ghost. Waylam, he makes me laugh. And he hears the voice of the spirit. Not in the same way I do. His spirit speaks of the great waters beyond this land. He pays heed to the spirit, and the spirit loves him for it. I do not. It is better to speak to the dead than no one at all. Wellem knows the spirit, but he will not know me. As I said, a bit of an odd duck with her spirit. Turn your back for the barest moment and Rayclast bites you in the proverbial. I imagine that's how you're feeling upon visiting us this time. It's how I feel about now. I'm afraid that the Inquisitor's spirit has indeed returned to the Chamber of Sins. Yet while you won't encounter Melagaro by wandering his halls, I do perhaps know how you can find him. Whilst investigating the Fell Shrine, I learned of the existence of a map forged by Melagaro from his own viscera. This map allowed him to transfer his spirit into another form of existence, an existential safe house to which he could retreat should death ever attempt to take him. Understanding the map's purpose, Vol tried to destroy it, to no avail. So he locked it away deep within the ruins of Frisia Cathedral. Find that map and place it upon the reverie device in Melagaro's old laboratory. And when you step over that threshold, expect the very worst. Uh, yeah, that is a little bit more sane. Don't get me wrong, I've witnessed many unsettling things in my lifetime, but a spectral corsair living next door to me? We reside in dark times indeed when the living need share their quarters with the dead. I didn't think it possible for Silk to grow any more peculiar, but then I've been wrong about so many things since coming to Rayclast that I shouldn't have been at all surprised. Still, it's interesting that his behavior of late has mirrored that of certain Templar zealots I had the dubious pleasure of meeting back in Theopolis. Like them, Silk appeared obsessed with finding answers to this reality in some ethereal realm of divinity. For my part, I prefer to keep faith in this world. The answers that come from beyond are seldom the ones we want. That's a nice and down-to-earth approach. My poor Groost, a kind man, a strong man, and now I begged him not to meddle with that relic. It washed ashore after the earthquake and Groost simply had to know whether it was a danger to us, to me. The unholy thing within that device, it possessed Groost, turned him into a monstrosity. We fled the village and as I turned back, I saw he was killing them. The stragglers, killing them all, even the children. My Groost is dead. That thing that has stolen his body. Please, destroy it. I'm aware that you and Groost had something of a commercial relationship prior to his... accident. As is the Asmeri custom, Groost's few possessions have now passed to me. I'm by no means the warrior he was, yet I know my blades and bows well enough. At least it's something I can do to honor his memory, and to keep my mind off things. Go with courage. Okay, so in the old tradition, let's do the same thing in reverse. Let's see if any new lore got added. Hello. Good to see you still kicking. Yes. Ina's a pretty young thing, ain't she? Bosoms to eclipse the sun she has. Eh. Might be that I spent some time here. Get to know the lass a tad more. Never mind that she's young and alive and I be... Um, old and dead. Once she hears me poetry, that is. Not a girly alive who won't want for a bit of the old rot tooth once he breaks out the earth. Tongue twisters and word plays. 
Not that she'd likely hold much interest in an old ghost like me. Still, a man can dream, even a dead one. Ah, that lassie. Pretty on the eyes, I reckon. But she's got her knickers pulled up far too high. Bit up tight, if you ask me. Eremir, though he's a tad dull, tends to ramble on a bit. Still, he's a few interesting stories of his own, so might be worth chewing the fat with from time to time. And sin on Ralakesh. Let us go hunting, this time amongst the ruins of an encampment most familiar to you, once inhabited by your friends, the Asmeri. Hmm, Ralakesh. He's ruthless and cruel with cunning unfathomable, yet he bears one defining weakness, a fear he forged into chains of his own keeping. His is the terror of grasping too much and having it all slip through his fingers. It makes him irrational and therefore vulnerable. Master of a million faces. Doesn't even fit in the box. Ralakesh. The illustrious master of a million faces. I call him the god of hide-and-seek. While other deities waged wars, spread their seed, and laid waste to whole empires, Ralakesh perched on his throne in a dark palace of ebony, choked with incense, blinded by obedience, and deafened by a senseless cacophony of brass gongs. Thankfully, he never had the courage to peek over the high walls he built, else the world might have been in trouble. Okay. But with that, I think we've spoken with everybody in town. So that, of course, means next episode we can set sides out of town. Oh, Navali. Let's see if she has something to say about this place. Hello. Um, nope, nothing new. See you soon. Well, that's convenient. So, thank you very much for watching. And I hope to see you again next time when we set foot outside of town. Bye-bye.